now we are recording. Really quickly for announcements, as you can see, today is Red Friday again. So um, I guess I'll wait around. The only thing I'm really going to change about that is next Friday, since next Thursday is Marine Corps birthday, and next Friday is actually Veterans Day. Um, instead of getting extra credit for wearing red, you'll get extra, extra credit. I haven't decided how much. I'll probably like double up on it or something. But, you know, it's a pretty big day for the veterans, so uh, a good day to get even more extra credit for wearing red on Friday. Any questions about Red Fridays? And someone sometime this week was asking about WBSU Wednesdays and like what if they're not here? And to remind you, you guys can still participate in WBSU Wednesdays and Red Fridays even if you don't physically come to class. You know, and if you want details, send me an email and um, I'll explain it. So moving past that, the other announcement is exams. The exam will be on Wednesday. It'll be just like it always is. It'll be online. Don't go home to class. Make sure you're on. Make sure you submit it by 8.50. It's twice now we've done this, and people still mess it up and get upset at me. You have to submit by 8.50. You're going to lose 10 points for every minute you were late. Um, so that means after at 9 a.m., that's 10 minutes. 10 times 10 is 100. So you know after 9, it's just going to close because you're going to get zero points regardless of uh, how you score. So yeah, that's when the exam is going to be. I'm not sure when the review is going to be yet. Um, I'll let you know if you have input and you have like requests of when you would like the review to be. Let me know. What else? Make sure you do the steps, chapters eight, nine, and ten. Some people are doing horrible and they're like, "Oh, I'm not good at testing. I'm not good at science." But you haven't done the study guide, so it could be you're just not studying. It's the study guides. One last time, I take the questions from the study guides and I reword them, and those are the questions that are in your exam. So do the study guides, get your independent work points. Be prepared for the exam. What else? That's it. Any questions about anything? All right. You said Wednesday is the exam. Good, yes. Wednesday is the, Wednesday is the exam. Yep. And of course, I'll send that out in uh, well, yeah, a written announcement too on the classroom. But yep, Wednesday will be the exam. Well, if there's no other questions, let's jump back into it. To remind you, we're talking about evidence of evolution. We left off with evidence from homologies, um, and what we talked about basically with homologies was where things are similar. For example, or, uh, for example, homologous structures, right? We talked about the four limbs. Well, your book talked about the four limbs of mammals, but I also included some pictures of things like frogs and fish and birds, right? So the four limbs of tetrapods. Right? All tetrapods have this, these similarities of our structures, so that homologous structures. Then we got into um, like molecular homologies. We talked briefly about that, about how you know, if you look at the genome, the more something's genome is alike to another creature, then you think, all right, they're more closely related. The more differences there are in the genome, the less they are, uh, the less related they are. Then we got the vestigial structures, which are basically the structures that are still around. But evolutionarily, they're kind of fading out, and they don't serve a purpose anymore. Um, and again, like goosebumps for humans, right? They don't do anything for us. But back when we were hairier, they did because goosebumps would make your hair stand on end, and you get an air pocket, and that would add an extra layer of insulation, and it would help you stay warm. Now we're caught up, and we're going. Oh, sorry. In, uh, excuse me. Attendance. So as always, if you're online watching the video or not watching the video, if you're currently online. Make sure you send in the attendance words uh, before 9 a.m. And the first attendance word is going to be this one right here. I'm going to circle it and not say it. There it is. Circle. I'm also going to point an arrow to it. That's the first attendance word. Anyway, while we're talking about homologies, homologies can also explain observations about embryonic development that are otherwise puzzling. Uh, your book only gives one example, if I remember correctly, so I'm probably not going to ask any questions about it. But if you look at, I mean, you don't even need to read that. Basically, we're going to, well, sort of. These uh, pharyngeal throat pouches, right? So if we're looking at embryos, again, if we're talking about tet tetrapods, so birds, reptiles, mammals, fish, right? They're very similar, especially if you look at the embryonic development. So here's a chicken embryo, here's a, chicken, a human embryo, and you can see these pharyngeal pouches. And the post anal tail, there's a lot of similarity because we start off basically the same, and then it's as we grow, that's where the difference is going to be. Uh, anyway, any questions about that? There probably be no questions about that on the exam. All right. Now, your book puts evolutionary trees under the subcategory as evidence of evolution. And I can kind of see that. 
and we're about to talk about evolutionary trees, but they're not really evidence of evolution. It's more like a way of displaying what we know from the evidence of evolution. And the introduction says this, that Darwin was the first to visualize the history of life as a tree with patterns of descent branching out from a common trunk. So as far as we know, anyway, Darwin was the first person to think of like all things alive and think of them, I don't want to say as a family, but as since, essentially as a family. Because if you think about a family tree, that's how you envision things, like one uh, ancestor from a long time ago. And then that split into some ancestors, which split into some ancestors, which split into ancestors. And that's what led us to where we are today. He was the first that we know of that thought of that. He was also the first, oh, excuse me. Um, so biologists, on that note, illustrate the pattern of descent with an evolutionary tree. And although the trees turn sideways, so like a family tree, which you usually see like this, the evolutionary tree is usually like this. And here's what it looks like. You might get a question about this on the exam. If I give you anything, you know, there's nothing to study, by the way. You just need to be able to interpret this. So if I give you this picture and say, what's more closely related? Um, I don't know, mammals and amphibians or mammals and, I don't know, lungfish. That would be an easy one. And it will probably be that easy. It wouldn't make it too hard. And mammals and amphibians are more, close, more closely related because we have a common ancestor. You can almost think of this as a timeline, right? This is a timeline, even though it doesn't show it. So this is like present day. This is a long time ago, right? This is the beginning of life as we know it. So there's a common ancestor between mammals and amphibians. And then that common ancestor had a common ancestor with lungfish a long time ago. So the more, the farther you move right, and the closer you are together on this uh, branch means the closer related you are. So again, there's nothing to study. It is interesting look, looking at though, like I kept using the word tetrapods, and this is what I mean, right, tetrapods. Actually, yeah, I'll leave it at that. I don't want to get into too much detail. Then we have amniotes, which talks about the eggs, and I won't get into that either. And obviously birds. There's a whole lot of things we don't get into. Another thing worth mentioning, again, you don't need to know this, because this is not that kind of class. But when it comes to evolution, and when you have this common ancestor, the common ancestor usually has something, well, in common. For example, like I was saying Wednesday, humans cannot make their own vitamin C, yet we have the gene to do it. Remember, then I said that's the same for all primates, meaning most likely there was one ancestral or well, one ancestor that had that mutation to where it couldn't make vitamin C, then all of its descendants, therefore, couldn't make vitamin C. And it's the same situation here. So this one common ancestor was the first to have tetrapod limbs. So then everything after it, all of its ancestors had tetrapod, tetrapod limbs. This one had this one ancestral organism had an amnion, which is the thing about the egg. You can look into it if you want. And then therefore, all of its ancestors had it. Um, feathers, right? But this ancestor had feathers, therefore all of its ancestors had, all of its descendants had feathers. Sorry, I haven't finished my coffee yet. I'm still waking up. Anyway, that's a long-winded way of saying, you know, I gave you a lot of information that you kind of should know, but for the exam, just be able to decipher something like this if I give it to you. Nothing to memorize. I'll give you this exact picture or something like it. And I might say, you know, which animals share the amnion? So you look at that and say, okay, it's all of these. Or which mammals or which animals are more closely related? These or these, right? And obviously the ostrich and the hawks are more closely related. Anyway, any questions about that? I like that your book points this out. Evolutionary, evolutionary trees are hypotheses reflecting our current understanding of patterns of evolutionary descent. So when you see that tree, well, that one's probably not going to change much. That's big stuff. Let me back up. I don't want to say set in stone. Set in stone is a bad, a bad word in science. But you're probably not going to, you're probably not going to see this change in your lifetime. This is probably how it is. But if you were to zoom in and look at all the different types of hawks and other birds, even there, that's going to branch out, right? There's birds. There's families of birds and there's genuses of birds and species, and they're all branched out and have a tree. And as we learn more things about evolution, especially by molecularly, when we look at you know, genomes, then we can tease these things out, and things will change. Again, probably not this, because that's a big picture thing. But if you were to zoom in on ocean, well, zoom in on hawks and other birds, or zoom in on lizards and snakes, or zoom in on mammals, obviously there's going to be a lot, a lot, of, uh, a lot more trees going on. So anyway, 
Any questions about that? Okay. And again, I said this on the last on the last lecture. There's a guy named Dr. Runke who uh, works here at Hamlin Hall. And this is what he does. He does it with tapeworms. So most people aren't very interested, but I'm interested in it. He looks at their molecular data. And he's like, first of all, he's found a few new species, um, but he figures out how they are related to each other. I find it interesting. That's called phylo phylogeny, but we don't even get into that. Anyway, if you remember, when we talked about the process of science, we skipped it, but I talked about it a little bit more than I usually do because I was basically saying, I said that back in the 60s, they decided that whales were most closely related to a hoof like, or excuse me, a hoofed wolf like predator. Right, that's what they thought in the 60s. And they did like 20 years of research to figure that out, had plenty of evidence to support that. So that was the leading uh, hypothesis. But then I love that your book does this. Now we're going to revisit that idea. Because in the 70s, right, a week or uh, a decade later, paleontologists unearthed a series of transitional fossils that supported the hypothesis that whales evolved. Oh, sorry, that's where we're already at, right? They, uh, so they, they thought that whales evolved from hoofed, wolf like carnivores. However, as science changes and tools change, technology changes, right? Molecular biologists using DNA analysis found a close relationship between whales and hippopotamuses, which makes sense. Even if you're not a biologist, or maybe especially if you're not a biologist and you're not thinking about DNA and genomes and things like that, if you just think, all right, whales are mammals that used to be on the land that came to the, came to the water and evolved to be in the water, hippopotamuses just kind of makes sense, right? Because yeah, technically they're land mammals, but they're always in the water, right? I think hippopotamus means river horse. Anyway, because of this new information, they proposed an alternative hypothesis of whale evolution, which is that whales and hippos are both descendants of a cloven hoofed ancestor. So maybe they got that part right. But here's the new, the new hypothesis, right? That uh, whales and hippopotamuses have a common ancestor, which then, because of the cloven hoof thing, has an ancestor, a common ancestor with deer. Pigs. So that's our current hypothesis. And I love that your book does this because that's what science does. It's not set in stone, right? We, we think we know what we know, given the tools that we have, but then sometimes things change. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that. If the PowerPoint in your book goes into a little bit more detail, so I'm not going to ask questions about it, and we're a little bit behind, so I'm just going to skip it. Um, we're just talking about some of the, the reasoning, right? What, what led them to believe this new hypothesis? Your book explains it, but to me, that's not important. To me, the most important thing of this is science changes, right? Nothing is set in stone. You're supposed to question yourself. You're supposed to question other scientists, and that does happen, which is a good time to say when people say things like the science is settled. That's why I hate using that word, because it's never settled. And also, the, the addressing the conspiracy theories, scientists love to prove each other wrong. They love to do that, right? They're competing for grants. They're competing for awards. That's what they do. We've got a guy in this building, a different guy. He, he wrote his whole fifth thesis. I basically call it, call it the nuh -uh thesis for his uh, graduate work. Um, I don't know how to put this without getting into too much detail, more details, but we think somebody thought they knew the different species of blackberries in West Virginia. You know, again, the revolutionary, or evolutionary tree. He's like, nah, that's not right. And he went and did some molecular work and proved it wrong and said, so he told you this is how they're related, not like that. So again, scientists love to prove each other wrong. Anyway, are there any questions about the evidence of evolution? We finally finished that. So we're about halfway done with this chapter. But the good stuff, the good news is the next step is relatively easier, and because of the fact that we've already had this in lab, some of this is going to be a review. But let's move forward and talk about natural selection as the mechanism for evolution. It's a great time to remind you. Evolution happens in many different ways. Natural selection is just a big one that we talked about, right? So there are other ways, but now we're going to focus on natural selection again. And the next word for attendance is going to be force, since we have some on the screen. So Darwin conceived the notion that artificial selection, which is the selective breeding of domesticated plants and animals to promote the occurrence of desirable traits, was a key to understanding evolutionary change. I'm going to get into a little bit more detail, but for now, for the exam anyway, let's focus on what artificial selection is. 
That's when humans choose which feature, right? So natural selection is nature choosing which feature is going to uh, be amplified, right? And, and artificial selection humans choose, right? So some group of humans over generations and generations decided they wanted a big horse and they made that. And then some other ones wanted a small horse and they made that, right? That's artificial selection. Every single dog breed, well, for the most part, every single dog breed is a result of artificial selection, right? And they're all descended from that one ancestral dog, wolf-like dog. They've all changed into like little chihuahuas or big old great Danes, all from the same ancestor because of artificial selection. Artificial selection has two components. You don't necessarily need to write this down because it also is the same for natural selection in this particular part. The two essential components are there has to be variation among individuals, and that uh, variation has to be here. So there's a picture of a bunch of different watermelons. That's a good example, right? So there used to be one ancestral watermelon um, you know, breed, if you will. And then there were some slight differences in it. So humans were like, all right, this one is slightly bigger because they started off really small. This one was slightly bigger than all the other ones. So let's make sure we breed that plant together. Let's, let's self-fertilize that plant. And they kept doing that, kept doing that, kept doing that. Now eventually you know, we have larger watermelons. And then they've been bred different ways. Have you guys ever seen like watermelon with white flesh or yellow flesh or orange flesh? Yeah, then that's not all red. But anyway, that's artificial selection. So you do need to know that, not for artificial selection, but again, we're going to talk about this for natural selection. There has to be variation, and that variation has to be um, heritable. Any questions so far? All right. Darwin knew that individuals and natural populations have small, fair, uh, measurable differences. So again, think about what we just said about what you need for artificial selection. There has to be variability. He knew that. Then he also knew that in natural populations, there was variability. One thing he did know was what forces determined which individuals became the breeding stock for the next generation. Because again, with artificial selection, we know, right? I wanted a short, flat-faced dog, so I just bred and bred and bred. And that thing was shorter than that one, or the rest of them, that one's shorter with the rest, than the rest of them was breathing. That one's got a kind of flat face, that one has kind of a flat face, that's breathing, right? Over decades, or generations and generations, we eventually had all these different um, breeds of dogs. But Darwin didn't know what was causing it in natural populations, which brings us to this guy. If you download the PowerPoint and click that link, there's a little video you can watch about him. If I have time, I'll make a video. A little bunch of questions to go along with it, so you can watch it for um, independent work if you want. But anyway, this guy named Thomas Malthus, he contended that human disease, famine, and war were the consequences of human populations increasing faster than food supplies and resources. I'm not going to ask you about that. Um, just kind of an introduction, again, helping you understand why Darwin thought what he thought and how he got to these conclusions. So he read this book, but he knew about Thomas Malthus. He knew that, you know, again, because human populations were increasing, obviously you're going to fight over resources, whether it's land or whatever. Um, so Darwin applied Malthus' idea to populations of plants and animals, and I know this seems really common sense now, but back then it wasn't. So he reasoned that resources of any given environment are limited, so the production of more individuals than the environment can support leads to a struggle for existence, and only some offspring survive in each generation. So think about like a wild population of gazelles or whatever. Like not all of them are going to be even, they're not even going to survive birth. And then you think, you know, some of them are getting eaten by lions, right? So basically, you know, you're having more, there's more individuals than the environment can sustain, but they all get killed for some reason, whether it's disease or, you know, falling off a cliff or predation, whatever it may be. Anyway, any questions so far? These are really heavy. Heavy uh, slides, a lot of words on them. I apologize. So, the evidence, essence of natural selection is unequal reproduction. If you take notes, you write that down. That is definitely a question on the study guide. Um, there might be a question on the study on the um, exam. Unequal reproduction. If everything was just hunky dory, and every population of every organism, they, you know, they were just having the perfect amount of offspring and they never died of unnatural causes, they just all lived to the old age, then you wouldn't have natural selection. There would be no advantage or disadvantages for any of your traits, right? Everything would just be a perfect little world. But it's not like that. As you already know, in natural selection, 
Individuals whose traits better enable them to obtain food or escape predators or tolerate physical conditions will survive and reproduce more successfully, passing these adaptive traits to their offspring. So I'm sure you guys have seen, the, for example, the squirrels on our campus. They all pretty much look the same. To me, they do. But I'm sure if you studied squirrels, you probably could recognize the difference. Oh, yeah, that one's. Look at that one. I call him Charlie. He's a little bit fuzzier than the rest, right? So if Charlie is a little bit fuzzier than the rest, and then we have some sort of ice age because we go into a nuclear war with uh, North Korea and we have ourselves a little mini ice age, then it's going to be very advantageous to be a fluffy little squirrel, right? So you can stay, stay warm in the ice age and not die. So little Charlie, little fluffy Charlie, would probably be more likely, to, more likely to survive, therefore procreate, therefore have a little fuzzy offspring, and then they'd be more likely to survive, so on and so forth. And after a few generations, we would have fuzzier little, um, fuzzier little squirrels on our campus due to our nuclear war with North Korea. Anyway, Darwin reasoned, so that being said, Darwin reasoned that if artificial selection can happen in a relatively short amount of time, right, if humans can do this in a, in a relatively short amount of time, given the age of the Earth, if humans can do it, surely nature can do it. Or as far as I'm concerned, again, I keep saying this, this idea that some people don't like the idea of natural selection as a religious reason, so I don't know if you're like me, I like to bring the two together, this is just my opinion. Maybe that's just the way God did it. Who knows? Maybe that was his plan or her plan or its plan, or whatever. Who knows? Anyway, any questions about this? That was just an introduction. Now let's actually get into natural selection as the mechanism for evolution and talk about natural selection in action. And then we'll talk about key points about natural selection. The book also points out that evolutionary changes have been documented in thousands of scientific studies. I've already said this a thousand times. Not a thousand times, but I had the word thousand on my brain. I'll we'll put it next to it just because I'm not going to ask you that question. The point here is this isn't some new hypothesis, right? We've done, we've done so many studies, and they always support um, natural selection. And your book also points this out. I'm going to put it next to this too. It gives an example of some bad natural selections that we see going on. Um, which is evolution of pesticide resistance in insect species. And let's talk about how that works. It's just an example, but it's important. And it's also um, natural selection that we see happening in our lifetime. So if you put a small amount of poison, right, you're cropping your dust, or maybe even you know treating for bed bugs, or whatever it is that you're doing, you have poison, you're trying to kill insects. And initially that will kill most of the insects, right? It kills most of the population. However, subsequent applications become less and less effective. And also, everything I'm saying right here is pretty much can be applied to antibiotics, too. Because the survivors, uh, the survivors of this poisoning, right, they are genetically resistant to the poison. There's something about their genes that make them resistant to it. They have an allele that enables them to survive the poison. Thus, since they're the only ones surviving, and then the only ones reproducing, and all of their offspring, some of their offspring, because you know how sexual reproduction works, some of their offspring will get that allele. And then those the offspring are the ones that will survive. Here's a nice little picture of what I'm saying. Of course, this is oversimplifying it, but whatever chromosome or whatever gene this is, some of them have the green allele, some of them have the red allele. Whatever it is about the red allele causes them to survive the pesticide. So then the survivors of that population mate. And of course, in this the way they put it, it's really simple because they both have the red allele. So obviously, yeah, we're trying to get into uh, mitosis and meiosis again here. But what I'm saying here is all their offspring have the red allele. So all their offspring survive. And then, again, as uh, generations and generations go on, you've now created this population of insects that are resistant to pesticides. How many of you ever, well, I guess you don't have to answer this because of but you can if you want. But I'll just talk about me. I had to do antibiotics. And, you know, there's very explicit instructions that say, you know, take it for 10 days or whatever. Make sure that even when you're feeling better, you continue to take it for the prescribed course. And this is why. Because what happens is when you apply the antibiotic, right, when you first start taking pills, you're killing most of the, most of the, antibiotic, the um, bacteria. But the strong ones are surviving. So you got to keep giving it, keep giving it, keep giving it. Otherwise, if you just stop and you feel better because you've killed most of them, the ones that do survive are the ones that are slightly stronger than the ones that die. So now you have this new infection that's stronger and probably a little bit resistant to the antibiotic you first took. Anyway, 
Any questions about that? I'm not going to ask any questions about that on the exam. There might be someone to study that. All right, let's talk about some key points for natural selection. Um, and the next word for attendance will be offspring. Again, I think I've had that keyword before sometime this semester. I remember talking about the band and how the lead singer has a PhD in biology. Anyway, I love this point. This is a very important point. Natural selection is more of an editing process than a creative mechanism. Meaning, like, nothing's happening as far as, you know, scientifically, we can say nothing's happening on purpose, nothing's guiding this. It's all random. For example, like I said earlier, today and on Wednesday, we can't make vitamin C, right? We have the gene to make vitamin C, but it's broken. So if evolution was an edit, editing process, we would just evolve that gene right out of our genome, right? We don't need it. Excuse me. If it was a creating, creative mechanism, right, we would, just, we would get rid of it, or we would fix it. But it's not. It just so happens that there was that random mutation that broke the gene, right? And uh, there's no reason to not have the gene, so it doesn't get, doesn't get removed. Anyway. Because it's an editing process, it can only amplify or diminish heritable traits. So the black moths, right? When it was really dirty out, the black moths had an advantage. So we can amplify that black trait, make it diminish the white trait. But to be clear, again, because some people miss this, the first black moth didn't come from the pollution. The first black moth that was just a random mutation that just happened to be, oh, there's a black moth. And then it edited population to get rid of the dark of the light ones and amplify the, the dark ones. So an organism in its lifetime may acquire characteristics that help it survive, but acquired characteristics cannot be passed on to the offspring. For example, and no one ever said this, I'm just using this as an example because we just talked about it, but if you talk about those moths in the, in the uh, Industrial Revolution, if you had a white moth and it was just covered in soot and it was black because of that, then yes, it would have a certain, it would have the same advantage of a naturally black moth, right? So it would be just as likely to survive and just as likely to reproduce and just as likely to pass on its genes. But the thing is, its genes didn't make it black. So its offspring wouldn't acquire that darkness advantage, right? The darkness advantage in this hypothetical situation I'm talking about, which is due to it being covered in soot, right? And that is not inherited. That's an acquired characteristic. So any questions about that? Again, natural selection is an editing process. It's not creative. It's not goal-oriented. If it was, humans probably wouldn't, you know, eat, drink, and breathe out of the same hole. That's really dangerous. You know, a lot of creatures do, but when you think about it, it's a very dangerous thing to do. A lot of people choke to death. For example, whales, dolphins, they do it out of two different holes. Very smart idea, which is what I'm getting to with this next slide. Natural selection is not goal-directed. It doesn't lead to perfectly adapted organisms. Humans are far from perfectly adapted. If I had time, if this wasn't a 100-level book, I would have you guys read that book. I mean, 100-level course, I would have you guys read that book that I, that I finished last year. It's a really good one. Talking about all the flaws in the human body and genome. Also, this is worth pointing out. A trait that is favorable in one situation may be useless or even detrimental in some circumstances. And I came up with a completely hypothetical situation here. And this isn't a great example. This is more of a good example, a better example for the first bullet point, which is it's not goal directed. Um, so if you have a, because you might tell what that is, it's a claw, right? Probably an eagle claw. Obviously, the bigger an eagle claw is, the better to an extent, right? Because it, the purpose of that claw is to grab fish so it can eat. And if it can eat, it won't starve to death. It's more likely to survive, more likely to pass on its genes. However, you have to think that it has to be a point where it can get too large, right? So yes, they're good at killing, but if they're too big, you can't even function with them. So then you're going to starve to death, ironically, because your claws are too big and you can't grab anything and you can barely perch, right? So in that situation, again, a trait might be favorable in one situation and detrimental in another. And that, I'm going to put it next to that second bullet point, because we're actually going to come back to that concept. And I'm going to give an even more off-wall situation, hypothetical situation. And it's going to involve humans. But um, 
Anyway, any questions about this slide? All right. Now we're going to get into the stuff that we talked about in lab. So if you will, this is almost like a lab review. We're going to talk about the evolution of populations. So we're done talking about natural selection for now. Now we're backing up, right? A bigger picture. We're talking about all the different types of evolution. The first thing we're going to talk about, even though we've already talked about it in previous semesters, is the source of, uh, excuse me, the source of genetic variation. We'll get to that in a second. Your book points out, since we've already talked about what Darwin knew, let's talk about what he didn't know. He didn't know how the variations that are the raw material for natural selection arise in the population. So again, he knew that natural populations had variation. You know, he could look at birds, the species of birds, and see they're slightly different. And he did. Remember, he collected thousands of specimens when he went around the world. So he could say there was some variation. But how did that variation get there? He also didn't know how these variations are passed along from parents to offspring. So he could see, like, all right, this bird with a slightly larger beak than the rest of them had babies with this bird. Sure enough, their offsprings had slightly larger beaks. This is all hypothetical. So he was like, how did that happen? What is it that causes that? He knows that it happens. He doesn't know why. And more importantly, to me, this is more interesting. He didn't know that Mendel had already answered these questions, right? So all the stuff Mendel knew, Darwin didn't know. And all the stuff Darwin knew, Mendel didn't know. And they were kind of doing these things at the same time. There was only internet <laughs> and better communication back then. What a, what a time it would have been. So. Anyway, that's just the introduction. Let's move into it about the sources of genetic variation. As you already know, individual variation occurs in all species. Actually, we've never said that. So we've talked about individual variation, but I've never said this. Yes, individual variation occurs in all species. Sometimes it's hard to see, especially if you don't study it. You know, like if I were to show you a bunch of slides of E. coli bacteria, you're just looking at them under the microscope. To you, but probably to me too, I won't see any variation. Like, yep, that's a bacteria cell, you know, that's bacteria, that's bacteria. I won't see variation, but it is there. Um, for us, for humans, like here's what you know, a bunch of pictures of people, or just look around in the room, even though there's only three of us, there's obviously a lot of variation between the three of us. Right, so there's obvious physical differences. And then again, and I've been, I have said this before, there's also phenotypic variations that are observed on the molecular. So again, like sickle cell disease. You can't look at somebody and say, oh yeah, they have sickle cell. But that is a genotype variation that leads to a phenotype variation. And phenotype is something that we can't see when it's sickle cell. Um, obviously, not all variations in a population is heritable. For example, my brother and I, you know, I'm tall. My brother's a lot taller than I am. And I'm sure some of that might have to do with genetics, but considering that we are very close close genetically, probably a lot of that has to do with um, um, the environment too, right? So some of the variation might not always be here. Or if you had like twin sisters, for example, or twins, identical twins, if one of them likes to hang out in the sun all the time, the other one's like really smart and says, oh, I don't want to. I want to get skin cancer. So you have one that's really dark and one that's really light, but they're identical twins. Right? That's variation, but that's not heritable, right? Because one of it's just environment. So again, it's only the genetic component of variation that is relevant to natural selection. So in a sense, this slide is pretty redundant. We've all we've been hinting at this a lot. Sometimes we've explicitly said some of this. Are there any big, uh, questions about this? Here's a picture. Of a certain species of snake. These are garter snakes. It's all the same species. According to your book, they were all the same population. And I'm going to learn what a population is later. But let's just say they were all living together. It's the same species. It's hard to see with the sun shining on it, but they look quite a bit different, even though they're all the same species. They have these natural variations. So, where does this all come from? As you already know, mutations is the answer. And that will be a test question. I said this when we talked about mutations. I said this is the source of genetic diversity. And now I'm saying it again, now that we're talking about why genetic diversity is important. New alleles originate by mutation. So I'll even circle it to remind you this is important. New alleles originate by mutation. So every single variation, every life on all life on Earth, well, all the heritable variations. It all came by by a mutation, either a recent one or maybe some thousands of years ago. 
millions of years ago, billions of years ago, it was all by mutation. As a matter of fact, I think I read somewhere recently that all people with blue eyes have one common ancestor. If I remember correctly, I could be misremembering that. But if I remember correctly, that is the case. Anyway, as you already know, and you will get tested on for this exam on Wednesday, probably not the next, next one for chapter 13, but what is the mutation? It's a change in the nucleotide sequence of the DNA. Remember, it could be small, like one single uh, nucleotide sequence, or nucleotide, or it could be huge. Either way, it's a change in the nucleotide sequence. And again, it is the ultimate source of genetic variation that serves as the raw material for evolution. So again, thinking about those the moths, right? They were all light-colored moths that were peppered, whatever. And there was some random mutation that, as far as we know, had nothing to do with the environment, just randomly happened. Then all of a sudden, boom, we had however many were born from that one, maybe a few dark moths. And they were the ones that had that new gene, that new allele, that allowed them to evolve. Anyway, as you also know from previous chapters, in multicellular organisms, it's only the mutations in the cells that produce gametes, right? They get passed along. Somebody asked this great question before when we talk about mutations. So, you know, if I get, again, if we go to nuclear war with, uh, with North Korea and I get hit by a blast, I don't know how, but somehow only my arm gets hit. Maybe I'm in, like, in a really good place to hide and my arm's dangling out. I don't know. I get hit by a nuclear blast and it's far enough away where it doesn't, like, blow it off or toast it. But there's still enough radiation where I get some mutations. Well, that's not going to affect any of my offspring. Well, first of all, because I'm not having any more offspring. But second, because it's in my arm, right? I don't produce offspring with my arm. Now, if you were to get exposed to radiation in this region, right, where you make your gametes, where you make your sperm or your egg, that um, mutation could pass along. Now, I'm going to put it, uh, I'm not going to put it next to that. As far as the exam is concerned, that's a little bit less important, this bullet point here. But it's still really worth thinking about, right? So it's not like every mutation that an organism gets they're going to pass it along to their offspring, right? Because it has to be in their gamete making area, so to speak. And not only that, but to throw it back, since you're about to be testing on this, remember, when you make gametes, you know, it splits apart, right? So you have two alleles. For every, for every gene, you have two alleles. They might be the same, but you have two of them. And when you go through meiosis and they split up, right? You have one allele and one sperm or egg, and uh, one allele and the other, one from your mom, one from your dad. So unless you have a mutation on both alleles, and 50% of your offspring aren't even going to have that mutation that you acquired in your lifetime, right? Because you're only passing along one allele. Anyway, any questions so far? All right, this is also kind of a, re a review. We've already said this before. But a change as small as a single nucleotide in a gene can have a significant effect. So again, we use sickle cell disease as a great example for that, right? We change one nucleotide, and then because of that, we have one different amino acid. Because of that, we have this whole different shaped protein, which leads to a different shaped red blood cell, which leads to this disease and all the symptoms that go with it. So that being said, this kind of eases into this next bullet point. A random change in an organism's DNA is not likely to improve its genome any more than randomly changing some words on a page are likely to improve the story. So usually what we're saying here, and we kind of already said this previously when we first talked about mutations. <coughs> mutations, well, first of all, mutations are usually bad, right? So they're usually not good. And that kind of, that kind of says the same thing, but in a different context. Assuming it's not bad, the mutation, it's even less likely that it's going to actually be good. Right? It's just going to be a random change. So any questions about this slide? All right. A mutation that affects a protein's function will probably be harmful. So again, most mutations probably won't do anything, uh, or they will be harmful if they do do something, especially if this is the case. If they affect the protein's function, that would also, you would assume that would be harmful. But on rare occasions, and this is where we get natural selection from, the mutated allele may improve the adaptation of individuals to the environment, enhances reproductive success, and this is more likely when the environment is changing in such a way that mutations that were once disadvantageous are now advantageous. 
right? Again, using the black, black models as an example. Let's think if there was no pollution and that mutation happened. Maybe it did, who knows? Maybe there was before the, the first documented black moth, maybe it happened before. Maybe there was some black moths before, but everything was nice and clean. So those things were picked off really quick and they never got a chance to be produced, right? Because back then, when things were clean, there was no advantage. It would be disadvantageous. So that would be deadly and that would not get passed along. That would be a mutation that probably would not get passed along. But then, where to go? Here we go. The environment changed, right? Things got dark, and then it was advantageous. Um, so then they passed along and amplified in the population. Another real life example. Does anybody can anybody tell not these little white things, but these little red things? Do you know what those are? Red blood cells? Correct, red blood cells. Do you know what those are? I don't, I don't expect anybody to just by looking at it. Those are red blood cells too that are infected with malaria. Anybody know what this is? I've shown it to you a few times, and I don't really expect you to know, but anybody know what that is? That is also a red blood cell, but it is one that is infected, or not infected, it is one that has sickle cell, right? So it has the mutation and it looks like this as opposed to this. Now, I don't remember if your book gets into this or not, but does anybody know? Which population, which group of humans per capita has sickle cell more than the rest? And it's kind of an, almost a sensitive topic because now you don't want to say anything about race. But how are we going to say, all right, let's break it down into two? If you have people of African descent, this is also funny to say because all humans came from Africa, but you know what I'm saying. If somebody from African descent versus a group of people from African descent versus a group of people from European descent. Which group would have more people that have sickle cell diseases? Anybody know that? African. Yeah, the people of African descent. Because of what I'm getting at here. So far, I've always said sickle cell is a bad thing. Because it is, right? Because when you have it, we talk about all the different bad things that happen because of it. But what I haven't said yet is that sickle cell helps prevent malaria. And malaria comes from mosquitoes. And mosquitoes love warm, tropical, wet places like Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, right? So when this, um, when you had this mutation, right? Yes, some people died from it, but a lot of people survived because of it. And because of that, the mutation passed along, passed along, and you had more of it in your population, which is why that group of individuals has it more per capita than at least um, Caucasians do. I'm interested, you can look this up for independent work, because I either don't know or don't remember I'm also interested in Asians on that. Do you think about Southeast Asia? That's also very tropical, and they have malaria too. So I'm curious if the if the numbers add up there too. Anyway, it's a great example with it, where um, something that could be bad can also be good. And then this hypothetical situation, which is this guy, a larger fella, right? Let's say he's just as active as everybody else, and he you know eats just as healthy as most other people. Yet for some reason, he's really fat, right? Like when he eats, he just puts on the pounds. I kind of feel like him. But that would be advantageous, right? It's unhealthy to be large. I don't know, maybe I should have found somebody larger to really um, put the point through. But it's advent disadvantageous to be large. It's, unhe it's unhealthy. But let's say again, we go to World War III with North Korea. Nuclear bombs are going off everywhere. There's hardly anything to eat. A lot of people are starving to death. This guy might be doing okay because whatever's in his genomes, genome that allows him or makes him just get fat and like retain all the calories of almost everything he eats, whatever mutations he had that made him fat is also now in World War III the mutation that's keeping him alive because he just needs a little bit of food and now he's good for a while because he's conserving all those calories and he'd be more likely to reproduce because he'll be alive, right? So then his offspring will have that mutation, at least half of them, right? So. Anyway, just a hypothetical example of how when things change, something that was once bad can be good, and that's how things get passed along in natural selection. Ooh, any questions about that? All right, so more stuff that we've kind of already said before. Chromosomal mutations that delete, disrupt, or rearrange many gene loci at once, or locations, right, are almost certain to be harmful. And man, there's some exceptions to that. You can look that up if you want for uh, independent work. Really wish we had time to get into it. There's whole chunks of our chromosomes that have been like duplicated. Like if you had a chromosome like 
that there's been like just whole chunks that have been copied and then like pasted on another chromosome. Just whole chunks. And I'm not talking about crossing over either. I'm just talking about like viruses that we've had, like our ancestors have had, where things have been copied and pasted. And then maybe like copied and pasted and pasted and pasted. It's so interesting. I really wish we had time to get into it. But anyway, uh, yeah, chromosomal, yeah, we talked about that. Um, duplications of a gene, it's kind of what I'm saying here, right? Copying and pasting and pasting and pasting, or small pieces of DNA through errors and mitosis can provide important sources of genetic variation and can eventually lead to new genes with novel functions. I'm going to put a big X to this, not because it's not important, it's just because without really getting into it, I can't expect you to really understand it, so therefore I'm not going to um, test you on it. Point is that basically what this is saying is everything I've talked to you is true, but it's so much more complicated and interesting than anything that we, we're just scratching the surface. Um, I've also already hinted at this. In prokaryotes, mutations generate quickly. Um, I didn't specifically say that, say that, but I did say this part. Oh, no, not this part. I did talk about eukaryotes, right? So for us, it takes longer, right? Because when we have a mutation, well, we have two versions of each allele. So it's a 50-50 chance that your offsprings are going to get the mutated version. In prokaryotes, that's not the case. They're haploid, right? So they only have the one chromosome. So if they have a mutation, then they go through mitosis, because that's how they do um, reproduction, right? The asexual reproduction. That's a perfect copy, right? My, mitosis makes a perfect copy of it. So if it acquires a mutation, then all of its offspring will have it, and then all of its offspring will have it, so on and so forth, right? It's a perfect copy. And then, of course, for plants and animal and fungi and protists and all eukaryotes, that's not the case. So if I were to require, acquire a mutation, then again, only statistically, only 50% of my offspring would have it. And then, for those that did have it, statistically, only 50% of their offspring would have it. And then, for their offspring, those that did get it, statistically, only 50%. So remember the laws of probability. So we're talking about one half times one half times one half times one half times one half. The chances of it getting passed along in a generic uh, population are very random, uh, very small. And your book gives a number, you don't need to know this, but on average, there's about one mutation in every 100,000 genes per generation. I'll put an X to that because you don't need to know it, but there you go. So again, it's very rare for it to get happen and get passed along. Not only that, but what happened have mentioned earlier, but relatively speaking, eukaryotes, animals and plants specifically, have a long lifespan, or excuse me, long time between generations. Like, I wonder if we have one single bacteria on that we'll review, I'm sure. If we had a bacteria on that desk, one, when the class started, I wonder how many there are now, right? Compared to how long it takes animals and plants to have offspring. And of course, like I've already said, so I'm not going to say it again, this whole idea of a diploid genome, right? So we only we have two of each of them. So even though you'll have a you might have a mutation, only 50% of your kids statistically would get it. So are there any questions about that slide? The next word for attendance is next. As in, the, the next is the word. All right, there's no questions. And uh, again, we only have a couple minutes, but this is good because this is a quick review. Sexual reproduction, we've already talked about this. Sexually reproducing organisms, um, or for sexually reproducing organisms, most genetic variation in the population is from a unique combination of the alleles the individual inherits. So we already know that. And we already know what causes it, right? The three random components of sexual reproduction are independent orient orientation of chromosomes, homologous chromosomes. So again, when they line up, when all your chromosomes line up in myto meiosis, it's not like they're all mom on one side and all dad on the other, right? It doesn't work like that. They are independent of each other. And then, of course, we know they cross over. And of course, we know about random fertilization. That part will not be on the exam that comes from chapter 13, I don't think. It might be. But it definitely will be on the exam you're about to have on Wednesday because we talked about that when we talked about meiosis. And that's what we'll finish it. So we're done. Um, yeah. If you need me, I'll be online for office hours. You want to take a picture or begin a picture? Sure. Can you take it? Sure. All right. So that's your credit for everybody involved.